Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Alex Martin, co-chair of the Canadian Tree Fund. You're joining us for today's last installment of the 2022 uh, webinar series uh, before we uh, get into the new year. Uh, today, we're joined by Rhoda, the director of the Plant Response and the Environment Program at Vineland. She's also the lead of the Greening the Landscape Research Consortium and completed her PhD at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Forestry. Experience working in industry, academia, government, and nonprofit sectors is presenting today on You Don't Have to Go It Alone, a collaborative approach to greening the landscape. Thanks for joining us and taking it away, Rhoda. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, yeah, it's lovely to be here today. I've really enjoyed this webinar series um, in the past, and so it's great to have the opportunity to take part as well. Um, let's see here. Make sure I can forward these slides. There we go. Okay, so you see my topic is you don't have to go it alone, a consortium approach to greening the landscape. And what we mean by this is really focusing on those of you out there who feel like you're working so hard in order to improve your little section of urban forestry, um, whether you're the only person at your municipality that has anything related to urban trees, um, you know, on the side of your desk or whether you're a contractor that's planting trees and you're focused so much on high quality, but you feel like there's really not much economic value in it for you after you put in all this effort to make sure you're doing things right. Or maybe uh, you work at a nursery and you get frustrated because um, the trees that you're trying to grow are the ones that the cities all of a sudden don't want or vice versa. And you feel like here there's so many barriers out there and that you're doing all the work on your own. And so uh, in today's presentation, I really want to speak to how we can really work together and pool our resources in order to solve some of these big questions. So that way, you know, you don't feel like you're doing it all um, on your own. Uh, you have some friends out there in order to get things done. So before I start, I'm just going to introduce uh, the Vineland Research and Innovation Center. Some of you may be extremely familiar um, with us and others may be less so. Uh, so uh, Vineland is a, is a research institute, a nonprofit organization based in Vineland, Ontario. And the goal of Vineland really is to improve the economic viability, the sustainability, and the competitiveness of horticulture in Canada. And so we sort of center on five different research programs. Um, we have biological crop protection. So there you're looking at new um, biological control agents for improving pest control in greenhouses and automation where we have a whole really cool engineering team that's looking for new ways to, for example, use um, robot harvesters for different soft fruits and vegetables. And then we have a whole team that's looking at plant variety development, not just for roses, but for other crops too, to see if we can find varieties that are very specific to Canadian climates, right? We don't want to be growing the varieties that you know, work well in California or in England. We want Canadian varieties. And so it's a really quite cool team. Um, and then we have consumers insights where they're really helping to define what makes, for example, a really good, tasty, delicious apple, um, among other things. And then there's the responses and environment group, which is the one that I had. Um, and with this group, what we're really doing is, is we're working with growers to see if we can improve their production methods. Um, sometimes that involves, you know, testing new microbial amendments for improving um, vegetable yields, or um, we're looking at with tree nurseries to see if we can improve soil management practices in order to have healthier, faster growing trees. And a big part of the work that we do is focused on improving urban forestry and urban forestry outcomes. And so I'm just going to speak to some of the research that we've done in the plant responses and the environment team um, related to a lot of our urban forestry research. Uh, so this is the overview of my talk today, um, where I'm going to talk a little bit about the urban soil work we've done, our new tree culture research park, and then I'm going to jump into our consortium approach for improving uh, urban forestry. So the plant responses and the environment research group is really focused um, on a lot of things dealing with plants, but what's exciting for a lot of us urban foresters out there is all the work we've been able to 
do on uh, tree root health, especially in the last probably about seven years, nursery tree health. Um, and that's something that's so important because it's these nursery trees that become our urban forests, right? They are the trees that are planted in our cities. So we need to start with a, um, a good start of life for those trees there. And then as well, looking at tree planting best management practices in order to improve survivorship of these trees in such a harsh environment, uh, the urban landscape. And then we do a lot with soils and that's what I'm gonna talk about next. So what's a healthy soil? Um, yeah, what's a healthy soil? It's more than just ground up rocks and nutrients. Um, soil is a living, breathing thing. Um, and so in order to have proper soil health, you really need to have the continued capacity of the soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. So there you're really looking at making sure that your crop or your crop, your soils, um, not only have you know a certain level of nutrients but also can provide uh, for life of the microbes that are in there in order to be a fundamental um, functional part of your urban ecosystem so when we're looking at soil health there are a number of different things that we look at um, you might be familiar with soil texture right whether it's a silt clay a loam um, you may have heard a little bit about soil bulk density or how compacted the soil is. Now, spoiler alert, a lot of the urban soils that we deal with are really compacted. And um, even though this isn't necessarily the number one thing that you would test if you wanted to test your soil, it has great impacts on how well your soil can function in terms of its ability to hold water, its ability to provide um, organic matter uh, to microbes, its ability to support microbial life and in order to function as a, a healthy soil that will provide for trees. Then there are the parts of the soil health analysis that really kind of deal with more of the um, organic living things. So we have all the different types of organic matter, but also soil respiration. And soil respiration is really what that means there, soil breathing, um, how uh, the quantity of microbes that are in the soil and how they're respiring, how they're growing and breathing really says a lot about how healthy a soil is. If you have no respiration in your soil, your soil is dead. Um, and a lot of the organic matter that's present in there is not going to be able to reach your roots and provide the nutrients that your your trees need if you don't have something um, actually taking those nutrients and helping uh, the trees to access it there are other parts of soil health analysis like looking at the ph and the electrical conductivity which includes the amount of salts in the soil we're probably familiar with um, you know different trees uh, may need different uh, levels of pH in the soil in order to survive. Some will do really well in alkaline soils and some will not at all. Um, and so it's important to know that about your soil when you're choosing specific types of species um, for your specific uh, soil environment. And then there are the parts of soil that are related to their ability to hold water. So the saturated hydraulic conductivity, the soil water potential, really the water holding capacity of that soil. So when it rains, what happens to that water, right? Is it a heavy packed down clay and all the water is washing away? Or are there lots of pore spaces and organic matter that can hold that water and almost act like a reservoir for the trees for when they have drought later? You wanna have a healthy soil that has just the right amount of water holding capacity. I mean, you can also go on the other side where you have way too much organic matter and you have a muck swamp. Um, and that's not necessarily going to help your trees either. But being able to understand exactly what the water holding capacity of your soil has great implications, particularly for your maintenance regimes for your trees. So if you don't understand what that is, then um, you may be completely overwatering or underwatering your um, trees going forward. And a lot of these are connected. Now bear with me as you see all of these connections and how one aspect of soil health can impact another. Now I mentioned earlier about how organic matter affects soil respiration 
and how um, really soil respiration feeds back into that. Um, and how, yeah, extremely high or low basic uh, pHs can um, harm microbial communities and harm the plants that are growing on them. Uh, and then this one's kind of an interesting one here. I want to just do a little side story here. So we once worked with a municipality that was really concerned about the soil they were going to plant their trees in, and they did the right thing. Um, they knew that the soil they had was basically like concrete, <laughs> and so they had to amend it. And they spent a lot of time and energy in making sure that they had a healthy soil to plant the trees. And it was healthy. However, uh, when that soil was tested the next year, it revealed that all of the microbes were completely dead and you had nothing uh, really living and breathing. There was no soil respiration in that soil. And it turned out that it was on uh, an area of the city that was highly treated with salt and that the salt content in there was not necessarily showing up in um, a dead tree right away. You didn't see chlorotic leaves from that overabundance of salt in the soil, but the first signal that there was too much salt in that soil was the lack of soil respiration, the lack of microbes, the death of the soil in a sense because of that salt. And uh, without being able to really understand those connections, uh, you can't really do the post-mortem to figure out why this tree died maybe two or three or four years later. Um, but studying the soil, you can really see those indicators right away. And of course, these are related to nutrient analysis. And nutrient analysis or soil chemistry is something that we will often, you know, do as uh, plant researchers, right? We, we want to know what the nutrients are, but it's important to know that that's just a snapshot in time. Um, and that can be improved by, you know, some quick application of fertilizer. And if so, that happened recently to that soil before you testing, before you test it, that's going to have an impact on how healthy you think that soil is. But when you realize that the nutrients there are really sustained by all of the other factors going on in the soil, um, you can see that it's just one small part and that testing for nutrients alone is not going to give you the picture of whether your soil is uh, functioning well on its own. Okay, so if we dig a little deeper, um, just to explain some of these uh, topics again uh, a little bit more thoroughly, I hope <laughs> this uh, soil triangle here is familiar to you. Um, and this is often where we start. Where does your soil um, fit in terms of a silt clay loam? Because that will have impacts on uh, so many other aspects of your soil health. And then there's the biological aspects. So understanding that there are different types of soil organic matter and that those are related to the microbes in your soil and how much um, your soil is breathing, because that will impact how that soil organic matter is actually you know, feeding your trees. So understanding those relationships um, are particularly important. And then as well, um, the chemical aspects of the soil, like the pH and the salts, and to a lesser extent, um, some of that nutrient analysis. One other thing that I want to mention when looking at a healthy soil is that it's important to not just um, look at it this linearly. Um, when you are testing your soil, it's important to have a lot of spatial diversity, right? Of course, if you're looking at a large field, you're going to test throughout the field to understand what's going on. But one factor we often miss is temporal diversity. So testing uh, the soil multiple times during the year to really understand what's happening with that soil, particularly as it relates to something like, for example, carbon. So if we are curious about whether our soil is a carbon sink, like storing the carbon, um, or a carbon source, you know, releasing that carbon, um, you need to look at it temporally, particularly if you want to find out whether the management that you're doing for your soil, your trees, is going to have an impact on carbon. And this is something that's really quite important, particularly as we go forward looking at trees as one avenue in um, combating climate change. Uh, 
trees store carbon for sure we know that um <laughs> that is what they are they are carbon beings but in addition to trees a lot of what they store is going on in the soil underneath and it's really soils where that carbon can sit for a long time so being able to study those soils temporally helps us understand their carbon budget a little bit better but as well for other factors related to soil as well, it's important to not just test it and walk away. You want to see what's changing in that soil and how it's functioning. So just in summary, uh, overall, soil health analysis should be really centered on some of these specific aspects of soil health. Um, and that's distinctly different from just looking at soil chemistry um, because it doesn't really account for that dynamic and interactive system, uh, what's going on in the soil. So with this information that we, you know, have developed all about soil health, um, about two years ago, I guess it started three or four, um, Vineland developed a state of the industry report to really look at um, in this in this particular instance, uh, tree nurseries and what the soil was like there. Because, yeah, you can think your soil is healthy, the trees are growing, but really what's going on in terms of overall functional soil health. And so we worked with a lot of nursery growers in order to test their soils and find out um, their common problems. And um, this report is available for free on our website. You can access it. But it was interesting that, you know, the three top challenges that came up were weed management. Um, of course, that's, you know, an ongoing labor issue in addition to just uh, evidence, uh, understanding what needs to get done. But as well, soil compaction, right? How do you get around having compacted soil when you need to use heavy machinery in order to move your trees? Um, so that's an ongoing challenge. And then um, one that I feel like we really could address is the loss or difficulty of building organic matter. But what I like about this too, is if you're a tree nursery or if you are trying to grow uh, trees, um, maybe on the outskirts of a woodlot or maybe you're a conservation authority that's trying to um, you know, increase the amount of woodland that you have, some of these challenges may be your challenges too and you're not alone <laughs> and others are facing these as well and so we can learn from each other in um, best ways to address some of these challenges so now i'm going to go on to talk about our tree culture research park which um, allows us to take some of the lessons we've learned from urban soils and take them that much further in terms of um, researching urban trees so our tree culture research park is a very new thing um, and we're actually just doing our very first research experiments in it right now and this is on base what it looks like when you walk out um, into the field and it's these four by four 4.5 meter by 4.5 meter um, compartments that are each isolated by themselves and you can plant a tree in each one of them but the best part about them is that you can control what's going on in the soil underneath. So um, if you really need to study, uh, you know, a certain amount of compacted soil and whether the soil at your specific site can be amended by, you know, some sort of compost amendment or some specific uh, maintenance practice, this is a place where you can study um, and have the fine tuning that you'd get from studying something like this in the lab or um, a really tidy greenhouse, but then on the scale that you need for urban forestry. I cannot tell you how wonderful this is from a researcher's perspective where I have done research trials in the urban forest where I've had to make a sample size of hundreds of trees in order to account for all of the human elements that happen in an urban forest. I once had it, I was um, studying how a soil amendment could improve tree survivorship. And, um, you know, I had over 100 trees in this study and I was looking at them and uh, I could see that the soil amendment was helping with some of them. But in one of my control trees, one of the trees that was not treated at all, the nutrient analysis in the leaves was like sky high through the roof and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And then I look back through my pictures of the trees in the study and I realized that in this instance, the homeowner had gone and hung a bird feeder in the tree. <laughs> and so this particular tree 
was getting high inputs of nitrogen every day that all the other trees in the study were not getting. And so it's all of those strange human elements that are happening in the urban forest. You can't avoid, um, but make it really complicated when you're trying to um, find some sort of statistical difference between what you're studying. So that's where these tree compartments are kind of the best of both worlds because you can't have a big tree study like this with these massive trees inside uh, a greenhouse or on a lab bench. Um, but it allows you to really um, get the sample sizes you need in order to answer the questions that you need properly. So the goal is to have um, 80 compartments. Right now, our initial block is 36 different compartments. And each of these have uh, four trees in them. And so we can do multiple experiments um, at any given time. Right now, the research trial that we have going on in them is focused on low impact development and whether some of the amendments that we could make to those uh, soil compartments could impact overall tree survivorship and growth. And it's part of some work that we're doing with uh, the town of Lincoln in order to uh, make sure that their new prudums development, which is on an old compacted site, will allow for healthy trees to grow um, with uh, healthy stormwater storage of the water and um, is the most functioning uh, soil system that they can have. So in our tree compartments, um, what we've done is we'll have a specific tree uh, species planted up here. So we're focusing on Freeman maples and then on the platanus, and then they all have this uh, grass seed cover. But fortunately, like in the city, we don't have to worry about whippersnipper damage <laughs> on those trees like we do in so many of our parks. But then um, right below that, this is where we have our soil restoration treatments. And that's really what we're studying in this trial is some of the trees will get one treatment, some will get another, some will be controls, and looking at those and um, comparing the health of those trees. And then the rest is uh, the decompacted soil that we aim to have at the site, and then the current compacted soil at the bottom. And so this is what our trial design looks like. And so we have each treatment, each one of those blocks, and we'll continue to track them. Now, the beauty of that uh, as well is that unlike in the city, you can have all of your soil monitoring and your tree monitoring devices there on site without concern that, you know, some kid waiting for the bus is going to find your little device and think it's interesting and play around with it. Um, you can keep all of these things in the soil and, um, you don't have to worry as much about them being tampered with. So we can study things like how the pH is changing over time, the soil oxygen is changing over time, soil moisture, soil water potential. <clears throat> we can look at a number of different factors. As well, above ground, we're looking at uh, the weather, transpiration, the sap flow. We're looking at stem humidity. There's all different factors that we can look at at these trees that we otherwise just can't do. Um, in a typical urban study. So this is some really exciting research for us and we're looking forward to see what sort of questions we can find answers to um, over the coming years. So that's the first piece about a lot of the urban forest research going on at Vineland. But this is where we jump into this consortium approach because doing the research here is just one piece of the puzzle. And we realize that we cannot solve all of the issues with urban forestry um, with our research alone. And other times, we might not know the questions to ask. We might not know the problems that growers are really going to have. We may think it has to do with, uh, you know, how a tree grows or increasing overall establishment, but maybe the problem is something else. And so by working together, we can ask the right questions provide our research projects together and help forward the cause of urban forestry collectively. So we know these urban forestry challenges. <laughs> um, we know that uh, there are numerous and they are growing um, and we're all trying to plant as many trees as possible in environments that continue to get harsher. And as we try to condense um, our municipal areas as well. You know, we're getting less and less space for these trees to grow too, and then throw into that new invasive species, uh, climate change issues. It's a lot. 
And it's more than any one group or any one um, research project can solve. So um, what Vineland had done in um, partnership with Brock University actually um, was really map out who all these key players are involved in terms of the urban forestry aspects related to planting all these new trees. And there are a lot, but there really are five key areas um, where um, you know different groups fit in. So we've got our municipalities, NGOs, and CAs. You know the folks that are planting the trees, like they have the sites, the land, uh, and then we have professional associations that may um, have a lot of knowledge based on what should be done or want to help their members in order to improve their economic viability. We have the consultants who might be helping to plan where the trees get planted. And then we have the developers who are trying to put as many trees as they possibly can in their developments in the right way. And they don't understand always if they're following the rules properly. And they want to make sure these trees survive at least for a few years. Um, and then we have all our suppliers, our nurseries, our landscape professionals that may be planting the trees. And sometimes they know the best practices and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they feel like they don't have enough supply. Sometimes they have oversupply. So we all have our own particular uh, questions and issues. But that's where we all are quite interconnected. Now bear with me as you can see how these key players are all part of this urban tree planting pathway. And each group sort of plays a role as these trees get planted. And these direct lines really reflect the conversations that are happening, the interactions that are happening between these groups. But then there's also the tree maintenance pathway <laughs> that almost seems to be going in reverse. And all of these dashed lines where it'd actually be really beneficial if these conversations were happening as well. It makes for quite a complex sort of diagram, but you can see how these connections, these conversations, the information sharing really could help improve um, a lot of what's going on in terms of um, planting the trees properly and maintaining them properly. And that's where we come in to help really bring everybody together in order to pool our resources, pool our knowledge, pool the evidence that we have, and as well, pool our confidence. And it sounds kind of silly, but when you think you're the only one doing something and you feel like uh, maybe the questions you have are not that smart, um, and then you realize that the municipality, you know, 10 kilometers down the road is having the exact same problems, the exact same question, then you don't feel as silly bringing up these issues and you realize you can work together to um, at least have some confidence in order to solve some of the issues that you might be having. So this is where I'm going to talk about our approach now um, with the consortium. Right now we are in the pilot phase of the Greening the Landscape Consortium and this was launched on July 1st 2021 and it's a three-year term and it's really this public private consortium funded by those industry partners and other um, partners, as you'll see, all working together to ask specific questions that we can work on together in order to start taking some um, collective steps to improve urban forestry. And our overall mission really is to build the collective capacity of the Canadian urban tree value chain by developing and mobilizing evidence-based knowledge within our collaborative network. I'm going to break that down. <laughs> so building the collective capacity, that really means working together as a group, right? You don't have to do it. Just one team isn't going to do it all. Uh, Vineland, as great as we are, we're not going to have all of the answers. So it's about working to, as a group. And then the Canadian urban tree value chain is that big network that I had just a few slides um, earlier, you know, where we have uh, the tree nurseries that are uh, growing the trees, the contractors planting the trees, the municipalities ordering the trees, and all of those all together, all of those players working together um, by developing and mobilizing evidence-based knowledge. So evidence-based knowledge really is um, information that you get by asking a research question and being able to really follow it through in order so that you actually have the, the proper answer as opposed to just going with, well, oh, that's the way we've always done it, so we think it's right but being able to find out what the real answers are in terms of the best practices. And when I 
say developing and mobilizing, that's really about packaging the information in such a way that it can be useful and applied. <laughs> we don't want to do the research trials in urban forestry and then have them sit on a shelf. Um, we want to make sure that the information that we're gathering together as a group for improving you know, overall tree planting success in urban forests is able to be used and applied and helpful. So these are our current members. These are the brave souls who really had a lot of gumption and curiosity to get together um, in such a unique group um, to work together as a consortium to improve urban forestry. And uh, like I said, this is our first pilot project um, as this group. And so we will have a new iteration of this starting in July 1st of 2024, where we uh, expect our current members to stay, but then build on that in order to solve even additional questions and, and continue to grow this further. So our approach is based on four pillars um, that lead into some uh, very specific case studies that we're working on in this pilot phase with the understanding that as we go forward um, and we you know, go past year three, we're going to have more questions to ask and we're going to be able to build on the case studies that we're working on right now. So I'm just going to describe those four pillars now because um, they're essential to our approach. So first we have our science and innovation. Um, I think this kind of makes sense. And this is all about um, pooling our resources to do research uh, trials that we wouldn't be able to do um, just one off on their own. Um, and so in this case here, we're working with a whole number of partners to um, really use data in order to answer the specific questions uh, that they have. And this gives us a much larger data set. So if, you know, for example, if you're, a small municipality and you're trying to answer a question about tree survivorship, but maybe you only have one or two sites that were planted recently, you might not have enough trees to really understand um, whether what you've done worked well or not. And so if you're able to work with other municipalities in the area and pool all your data, um, you can get your answers a lot faster. Now that knowledge mobilization piece or the information sharing, um, has already started right now. Um, we have our annual workshop. We have our Greening the Landscape our conversation series. And we just uh, had our most recent one about two weeks ago. And then we also share information together um, through our newsletters and then our case studies, which I'm gonna uh, describe a little bit more um, uh, at the end of the talk. And a lot of this is really fostered on collaboration. So being able to engage with each other, um, being able to ask the members themselves what sort of questions they have um, uh, as part of this. Uh, in addition to many conversations that we've had, we've had a questionnaire that was administered at the start of the pilot to really um, measure where folks are at and understand what sort of collective impact this is having on, um, on them and their urban forestry goals. And then the last part is um, operations and delivery. And so this is making sure that the work we're doing is actually shared and diffused, um, making sure that we are held to a standard to make sure that we're meeting our targets for our projects, making sure that we are holding ourselves accountable, that we're sharing the information that we're learning and developing the information that needs to be shared. And this is where we come to our case studies. We're really using case studies as our primary research method as part of the consortium. So what's a case study? <laughs> well, it's really a study designed to address challenges and opportunities that are re related to one specific member's contribution to the value chain. And it's a great opportunity to collaborate, identify priorities, or refine questions by dealing or working with others who may have really similar questions. Um, and it allows you to do these studies in the real world and um, have long-term research trials on a broader spatial and temporal scale than you'd be able to do on your own. And so we have these five areas, these five case studies that we're working on. Um, and these are all um, areas of interest identified by our members where they said, this is the issue that's most pressing to us right now. Please let's see what we can do to help 
um, answer some of the questions we have related to, you know, for example, canopy climate readiness or best practices for tree establishment. So then working with those specific case studies to really refine the question and see if there's something that we can do in order to improve that experience for them. Um, and so uh, all of these consultations were developed with our members and the members are continually actively involved um, throughout the, the entire project. So let's talk first about um, one of the case studies, which is best practices for tree establishment and maintenance. And this is led by um, Jason Henry, who's our king of soil and our lab supervisor. And so this is uh, with these specific partners and actually a couple others now, uh, really looking at how the soil impacts overall uh, tree establishment. This is based on some questions that groups had about, you know, we, how we did everything right in this tree planting. And yet, the trees still aren't surviving. Uh, what's going on there? And being able to figure out what's happening with the soil in order to improve the outcomes for those trees. Another case study that we have is um, by project lead, um, Samantha Witowski, and she's from Brock University, who's a continued excellent collaborator throughout all of the consortium. You know, they are involved um, with Vineland on so much that's going on behind the scenes in order to um, you know, communicate with our members and make sure that you're getting the information that we need, that you need. Um, and Sam is leading this public perceptions of tree planting and management. And this is revealed by a number of members saying that they had issues with, you know, residents um, not really understanding why they needed a tree or the overall benefit of urban trees um, and really, uh, drilling down to see what those issues were and if there was a way that we could address some of those public perceptions. Uh, and then we have our canopy climate readiness um, led by our uh, queen of roots, Charlene Williams. And um, Charlene is now working to expand tree species selections um, that will uh, allow cities to have a, more information in order to choose the best trees that will be um, you know, a little more versatile in the expected changing climates. And then um, this one's a big one that Charlene's also working on, and this is about grow contracts. So working with um, tree nurseries and municipalities to better understand what sort of um, work we can do on the front end and the back end to make sure that tree nurseries are planting the trees that cities will actually want to buy, you know, four, five, six years down the road, um, because that takes a lot of planning and a lot of communication. That's not always necessarily happening right now. And then the last study is uh, led again by uh, Jason Henry, and this is our training and tools. Um, and this one's kind of an interesting one because it seems so simple. Like we know best practices for planting trees, don't we? Um, but this is really looking at the three phases of tree planting on a larger scale. So about site planning, preparation, understanding what's actually going on with your soil and your sites before planting, and then obviously planting the tree green side up. <laughs> no, there's a lot more going on to that. And then the, the follow-up maintenance and understanding how best to share that information, not just with volunteer groups, but also with like city councils and understanding how all those spaces really tie into a healthy urban um, canopy. So members, bear with me here, are so important for driving this process. They're involved throughout. And I'm just gonna give you an example from the canopy climate readiness uh, case study, where you can see that all throughout the work that's going on, um, we have our members that are, um, well invested in the project to make sure that the questions that are asked are their questions and that um, when we come with a complete report and deliverables and um, recommendations for next steps and how you actually apply this it's going to be useful for them um, and so then at the end fortunately too we get to share this with all of the consortium members so even though you may not have been specifically involved in this case study you'll still get the information gathered from the other case studies from your co-members so just in summary um, I want you to know that you don't have to go it alone and that it's just been such a, a fun and um, rewarding opportunity to work with this consortium in order to green the landscape. Um, we learn a lot from each other 
and it's really helped uh, Vineland ask the right questions, the right research questions. Um, it's helped some of us ask uncomfortable questions, um, particularly related to areas where we think we should be experts, but maybe we're not. Um, and then working together to build that evidence, share what we learn, apply what we learn, and the best part of all, celebrating our successes. Um, so again, this is just this first pilot phase, and it's been a wonderful learning experience, and we're really looking forward to um, what will happen in future iterations uh, with the consortium going forward. Again, with that goal to really build the collect collective capacity of um, you know, the Canadian urban tree value chain um, to, to share that information with our collaborative network. So with that, I want to thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for your, your patience and, um, and please feel free to ask me questions. If you don't have time right now, my um, email address is on there. Just feel free to shoot me an email and um, I'll be in touch. That was terrific. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We, we already have some uh, comments and questions showing up. Okay. Uh, the first is around, how do you, uh, how do you see uh, an opportunity or potential for increasing developers' interests in maximizing tree planting? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I would say, first off, that there are certainly some developers that are already very well interested in um, improving their tree establishment, but a lot of this is um, related to uh, lack of monitoring, uh, a lack of requirements, um, so, of course, they're going to do the bare minimum if they don't know more um, and then being able to explain to them what will make a healthy tree and uh, and then provide financial incentives um, in terms of uh, actually laying it out for them, what needs to be done um, and follow up on that. Uh, but every municipality is going to be different and it's a tough one to prize apart. Um, but certainly, I think that's one big area of growth. A question on the soil on addressing soil compaction and bulk density. Uh, Virginia Tech had the uh, soil remediation program and, and, <laughs> and protocols uh, for adding in soil organic matter, but a component of that was using uh, back, a backhoe or a large excavator. Yep. You know, on the east side of things that uh, there's a lot of um, folks who are using like pneumatic air excavation devices, uh, vertical mulching. What do you see as current best practice for, for addressing soil compaction, but also at a meaningful scale rather than kind of the isolated pockets that are <clears throat> vertical mulching? Sure, yeah, and I mean, some of that is related really to the planting space. Uh, so from our past work uh, on the Highway of Heroes, um, we had looked at different remediation techniques for planting trees um, on highway sites where initially there were abysmal survivorship rates and a lot of that was due to soil compaction. You'd think initially it's due to salt, but a lot of it was just um, dead compacted soil and so there we had done deep ripping with different applications of compost and found that the deep ripping basically just cutting a line straight through was really beneficial um, and had great improvements in overall tree survivorship but that's not something you're going to be able to do on a boulevard when you've got um, you know all of your different lines and plumbing <laughs> going through there and so i would say that um, at those urban sites, um, making sure that you test the soil ahead of time so you know what the problems are. Um, and then at those sites, you should be able to do anything that you need to do with a shovel and a strong back. Great, thank you very much. Another, another question that uh, popped up here as well. Would you be able to expand on the work Vineland's doing to help increase supply chain communication uh, to help buyers understand demand and understand supply chain constraints? Yes. Um, unfortunately, I can't reveal too much at this point in time because that case study is right in the heart of it right now where we're really ha holding a lot of those interviews. Um, some of the work has been done in the past, but really um, building off some of the initial questions that we had in first identifying really what the problems are um, and then um, 
being able to see if there's anything that we can address besides just straight up policy recommendations in order to improve um, the supply chain. Um, so unfortunately, I will have a much better answer for you in about a year's time. Sounds good. Do you, uh, does Vineland publish a lot of the research in, in open access journals? Yeah, yeah, and it's actually something that we really try to focus on because, um, yeah, our goal is to really have applied, usable information. Uh, we will publish in journals, but we want that information to be usable. Um, and so often in addition to those publications, we'll have um, webinars or information sharing sessions where we'll actually go through our publications and share what we learned, um, just more of in a presentation format. And that's the same thing that we do when we're doing a research study for, you know, a municipality that might have questions about soils is, yeah, you can put together the PDF, but if you don't actually have that time to really engage with the material and work with someone and share what you've exactly learned, and then clearly line out, you know, some recommendations that they personally can be involved in for next steps, yet the information is not worth gathering if it can't be used. And for the arborists and urban foresters on the call today, uh, if they're interested in looking at Vinelands research, where where should they best go? Is there stuff on your website? Yeah. So if you go to the plant responses in the environment um, page on uh, Vinelands website, you should be able to access um, much of that there. Fantastic. Uh, that's that's it for questions Excellent. in the chat. So a big thank you for for coming today. Uh, and before folks start heading off. Uh, it is, of course, approaching the end of the year and approaching tax season. And so the donation fund for the Canadian Tree Fund's in the chat there. Uh, we are super happy for anything that folks can donate. Uh, if 20 arborists get together and start donating the, uh, the equivalent of one, one saw chain package, we're able to put one person through a year of, uh, of, our, of our scholarship program. So... Any donations greatly accepted, uh, tax receipt uh, for $20 or more. And so we appreciate that. We appreciate you, Rhoda, for, for coming in today, giving us a presentation on, on the importance of uh, collaborative efforts. And thanks for everyone for attending. Thanks, Rhoda. And we'll see you all thanks, Alex. in the new year in January for, a, for another presentation. Sounds great. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.